Well, good evening and uh, welcome from Kern Heights Baptist Church. It's Wednesday, May the 20th, and today's a special day because not only are we going to study uh, God's Word together, but today's uh, Deborah and, uh, and mine anniversary for uh, 32 years. So anyway, May the 20th is a very, very special day for us. And in um, May the 20th, 1988 is when uh, Deborah and I got married. And so anyway, just wanted to share that with everybody. Got just a couple of quick announcements and then we're gonna get together as far as studying God's word. Uh, we, I think I announced Sunday that we would have some new guidelines as far as meeting together. I thought those were gonna come on Monday, but it looks like this afternoon is when the governor is going to update the, the guidelines for churches, uh, you know, reopening. And so we're hoping that some of the parameters will be relaxed, but we don't know that yet. And as soon as we have that information, we'll get that out to you by group text. We'll also announce it on uh, Facebook. And then we have a team of guys that uh, some of our men in the church headed up by Fred Wetzel that call our people every week. And so uh, when you get your telephone call, uh, you'll, they should have that information uh, that they can share with you as far as, you know, if you have to wear a mask, you don't wear a mask, or uh, are things going to be the same, or are we going to be able to relax some of those guidelines? We just don't know yet, but as soon as we do, we'll get that information out to you. Uh, I want to again thank everybody that helped Deborah and I move into our new home uh, last Wednesday. And we're, we're getting there. We're not yet ready as far as uh, having everything ready for having people over. Probably couldn't do that anyway with the social distancing guidelines that we're, everyone's having to follow right now. But one of these days soon, uh, we are going to be able to have open house, and we look forward to uh, being able to open our home and just share it with everybody. And again, we appreciate everyone who, uh, who helped with that. Uh, today, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 21. We're going to be talking about tough times in ministry. So you may want to go ahead and find your Bible and look that passage up because in just a minute, I'm going to be uh, praying and then we're going to begin our study. One thing that I did want to announce, uh, tragically, uh, one, of, uh, one of our dear friends uh, and a faithful attender, Dr. Ed Revels, passed away earlier this week, and his service is going to be tomorrow, uh, Thursday, May the 21st at 3 o'clock. It'll be a graveside service at Locksburg Cemetery, and so please keep, um, you know, Arlene and his family in your prayers. So we're going to pray now, and then we'll begin our study. Heavenly Father, just guide me and help my mind to work clearly, Lord, as uh, I work through the verses that, Lord, um, you've put on my heart today. And I pray, Lord, that I'll be able to say some things that uh, will, Lord, you can engrave with your Holy Spirit onto the hearts and into the minds of your people. That, Lord, uh, as we minister to people, and not just the paid staff, but, Lord, uh, anyone and everyone who's involved uh, at Kern Heights, as, as all of us do ministry, that, Lord, when those hard times come, and when we face difficulties, that we will remember that Paul went through that, and Lord, other people have gone through that, and that Lord will not shrink back, but that we will keep going. So I just pray that you'll guide my study today, and that Lord, it'll be a great blessing to all who uh, listen uh, by way of Facebook. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are in a series. We're calling it Discovering America. It's a study of 1 Corinthians, and the reason I'm calling it Discovering America is that so many of the things that we see in the church at Corinth, and it was a church that had, had a lot of problems. Unfortunately, we see a lot of those things in the church today. And God is timeless, and uh, I think that probably uh, since the church, you know, was, was formed when Jesus called out his disciples and then it was birthed on the day of Pentecost when uh, the Holy Spirit came in all of his fullness. Uh, I think that there have been churches probably ever since then that have had the same kinds of problems that the church at Corinth had. But in America today, we see an increasing number of churches that unfortunately seem to have these same kind of issues within them. So uh, God in his wisdom included that in his word, and we're going to work our way through over the next few weeks, work our way through 
the book of 1 Corinthians. But today we're going to be in chapter 4, verses 8 through 21, and we're going to be talking about tough times in ministry. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to read uh, not all that passage, but part of that passage uh, to kind of lay the groundwork. But before I do that, uh, just kind of bring every, just to kind of bring everybody back up to date. Last week, uh, we we taught a lesson uh, in chapter four. I think the first seven verses called "How to Look at Your Preacher." We talked about the fact that a pastor, in fact, any leader in the in the church, needed needs to be or need uh, a pastor needs to be a servant leader. Uh, that was in verse one, where it says, "So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ." So. First and foremost, any leader in the church ought to see himself as a servant of Christ. And then as you serve Christ, you're going to want to serve other people. And anybody who you know wants to be a leader or claims to be a leader who doesn't have the heart of a servant, well, the church just needs to find someone else to lead because that trickles down. If you're a servant leader, that trickles down to the church. But if you're a person who wants to kind of lord it over everybody, that trickles down also. And then that causes a lot of people in the church to have the wrong type of attitude. We also mentioned that the scripture says that a a leader uh, or a pastor needs to be an effective teacher. Not a great teacher necessarily, but at least an effective teacher of the word. It says in verse 1, it describes you know, the, the, the church leader as someone who's entrusted with the secret things of God. And that's the idea of the mysterious things of God, things that with the help of the Holy Spirit and with the help of diligent study, you uncover and then you teach those and share those with the rest of the church. And then the last thing we said was that, you know, you need to be careful when you're judging or evaluating your leaders. Not that they don't need to be evaluated. They do. But Paul says in chapter 4 and verse 6 that you don't need to go beyond what is written. What that means is that, you know, I like this guy because he's a sharp dresser. Or I don't like him because, you know, uh, his he just doesn't have, his family's just not the kind of family that I can get close to. Or he preaches too long or he doesn't preach long enough or stuff like that. Personal preferences are not things that you need to use in evaluating a minister or a church leader. Instead, you go by what is written in God's Word. And he had to remind the people at Corinth about that because they were using personal preferences to uh, decide, you know, I like Paul or I like Apollos or I like Peter or whoever. So anyway, that kind of brings us up to tonight. And so tonight we're going to be talking about tough times in ministry. The church of Corinth could have easily been a pastor's nightmare because of all the problems that they had. I mean, you know, in 30-something years of ministry, honestly, I've never had to deal with people getting drunk when we're having the Lord's Supper. Uh, On Easter, I've never had to deal with attendance going down because a large number of people don't even believe in the resurrection. I've never had to deal with issues like that. Some of the issues at Corinth I've had to deal with, but... Thankfully, not all of them. But, you know, the church at Corinth could have easily been, and probably was, a pastor's nightmare because they had so much stuff, so much junk, that, you know, Paul and others had to deal with. And to make it worse, some of the people in the church didn't really want Paul or anyone else telling them what to do. And uh, you do see some of that today. When a preacher preaches about sin, everybody says amen. But when you start dealing with specific sins, that's a little bit different. But I think effective teaching and effective preaching needs to deal with specific areas of sin. Because otherwise, you go home thinking, he was talking about that guy across the aisle, or he was talking about somebody else. He wasn't talking about me. So remember, effective teaching and effective preaching doesn't just deal with sin in general, but it deals with specific sin and specific issues. So a teacher, a pastor, or a Sunday school teacher, or leader, needs to be willing to do that. Now, the people who are being taught need to be willing to hear it. And the people at Corinth, a lot of them didn't want to hear it. Uh, Jesus would say it this way when he was doing ministry here on earth. He would say, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, you know, this isn't for just the guy behind you or the person to the side. This is for you. 
And uh, the, Bob, the Bible, in fact, in, uh, I think it's in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul says, The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. So an effective teacher doesn't say just what people want to hear, but he says what the Word teaches and what the Holy Spirit gives him, and then he just lets the, you know, the chips fall wherever they fall. So that kind of lays the background, and I want to read beginning in verse 8, and we'll go down through verse 17, and then I'm going to try to tell you what these verses teach about tough times in ministry. So here's what the Bible says beginning in verse 8. It says, and Paul's being a little bit sarcastic starting out. I think he's frustrated. He says, already you have all you have all you want. Already you've become rich. You've become kings and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. You can probably see some sarcasm there as he writes these words. He says, to this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We're in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we're slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I'm sending to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. So we'll stop there for right now. And we want to try to answer in these verses the question uh, about tough times in ministry. What do these verses teach about tough times in ministry? I'm going to give you three things. Number one, tough times in ministry are unavoidable. And remember that. You need to remember that. Tough times in ministry or unavoidable. Now, that's true, you know, for Christians in general. That's especially true in ministry. Now, the truth is, every believer ought to be involved in ministry, but not every believer is involved in ministry. I think uh, it's been well said that 20% of the people do 80% of the work, and I think there's uh, a degree of truth to that. It differs from church to church. But in most churches, there's a small group of people who do the majority of the work. Everybody ought to be involved in ministry. And when you're involved in ministry, you can expect to see some tough times. And in fact, there's really just not a way to avoid that. A while back, one of the things that we needed to do here at Kern Heights was we needed to write job descriptions for everyone, including the senior pastor. And as I worked with the personnel committee on putting together a job description, one of the things that we put in there, and we did this on purpose, was that part of the pastor's job is to deal with unpleasant situations rather than ignore them. A lot of problems in church, whether it's the pastor who's dealing with it or somebody else, come from issues that everybody knows they're there, but nobody wants to step up and deal with them or handle those kinds of things. And so I think there's that human nature probably comes into that. But we put that in there on purpose because tough things, hard things, unpleasant things, they don't simply go away. In fact, if they're not dealt with, they kind of, it's like a sore you get on your hand that gets infected and then finally, you know, it festers and it becomes a lot worse than if you'd cleaned it out, put alcohol or, you know, uh, neosporin or something like that on it. Doing that hurts initially, but it means it's going to get better. And so very important to remember in ministry that tough times, that's just part of it. And so they're not to try to be avoided. Instead, you want to deal with those things. In fact, I believe this. I believe if you try to avoid dealing with them, you'll end up putting more work into trying to avoid dealing with them 
than if you actually, you know, man up and deal with them. Now, when we talk about ministry, one of the things that is important to remember is we're not talking just about paid staff. I believe it starts with paid staff, but if, if the paid staff's the only one doing ministry, then there's a problem there. In fact, we're probably not doing our jobs because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 that it was He, Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and then He says some to be pastors and teachers. Why? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So a big part of my job and other leaders in the church is to, to teach and to lead the entire body of people here at Kern Heights so that everyone is involved in ministry. Why? The reason I mention that is I just said a while ago that tough times in ministry are unavoidable. And so that means as ministry filters down to the church and as you're involved in ministry, at some point, sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with some difficult issues. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean you need to shrink back. We don't want you to do that at all, but it means you shouldn't be surprised when things come up that may be a little difficult to have to deal with. Now, under the heading of uh, tough times in ministry being unavoidable, I've got two or three things that I'd like to mention underneath that. And the first one is ministry is for anyone who is a believer. Um, I, I see this as a pastor that, that you know, it's so important that everybody in the church be involved. For example, when there's a death in the community, um, those things are always unpleasant. But one of the things that is a blessing to me is when I'm visiting with a family and you see people coming in. Maybe they're bringing food or they're just coming in to pray or just to visit or to help share that sorrow. You know, death is a, is, is, is a hard thing. But people coming in and ministering in a time like that that's a good thing. And, you know, there's some people that that's really, really, really out of their comfort zone. And that may be out of your comfort zone. But I'm telling you, even if it makes you uncomfortable, people still need you in times like that. And so I'd encourage you to do your part in making sure uh, that people are ministered to at times like that. Uh, at other times, it may not be ministering to somebody when a death in the family has occurred. It may be that the Lord's blessed you financially and there's somebody in the church or somebody that you're aware of who's a believer and they've got a financial need and you step in to help with situations like that and that's a good thing. Or maybe someone's gone through a divorce or is going through a divorce. And again, that's one of those uncomfortable you know, situations where I think as human beings, we have a tendency to, to step back and say, ah, you know, that's kind of uncomfortable and I don't want to get involved in that. That's the very time that people need you to pick the phone up and say, hey, we haven't forgotten about you. Sometimes when somebody's going through a hard time like that, there's a tendency to drop out of church. And so they need you then more than they've maybe ever needed you. And so don't shy away from tough times in ministry because ministry is for everyone or for anyone who's a believer. Now, with that said, ministry can be frustrating. Um, Paul was frustrated here in these verses. In fact, let me read again. Verse 8, he says, Already you have all you want. Already you've become rich. You've become kings and that without us. And then he says, How I wish that you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. He says in verse 10, We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We're weak, but you're strong. You're honored. We are dishonored. And so I think Paul is doing a little venting there. I really do. Uh, I think he was fed up and frustrated and, and all that. And that just tells me and hopefully tells you that ministry can be frustrating. The Apostle Paul wasn't the only one who's ever been frustrated in ministry. Even Jesus, there were times he got frustrated with, you know, the disciples. I think it's in Matthew 17 where they brought a boy who was possessed with a demon and the disciples tried to cast him out, and they couldn't. And Jesus looked at him and at them and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? So Jesus was doing some venting there. Moses in Numbers chapter 11, verses 14 through 15, 
even asked the Lord to take his life because he was so frustrated with uh, the people at that point. So just remember that, that ministry can be frustrating. There's a reason that the Bible uh, calls us sheep. I include myself, obviously, in that. Uh, it's because we do things that frustrate people. But just because ministry is frustrating doesn't mean that we give up and turn our backs on it. And then one more thing under the fact that tough times in ministry are unavoidable. unavoidable. And it's the fact that ministry is not always glamorous. Sometimes people look up on Sunday morning, and especially if it's a church where, you know, there's several hundred people in attendance, and they think, man, that's such a good gig. That's such a, a, a good job. I mean, you know, the preacher gets to dress up and everybody's paying attention to him. And, and you know, I mean, that's, that's, that would be something I'd really like to do. And they have the idea that, you know, ministry is just always glamorous and it's always, you know, where you're holding people spellbound while you're preaching on a Sunday morning or something like that. And, and really nothing could be further from the truth. Now, preaching, is, for me anyway, preaching is a lot of fun. I love sharing God's Word, especially on Sunday morning. I love sharing God's Word with God's people. But that's a small part of what a minister or what a pastor actually does. And in fact, uh, a lot of what you do isn't glamorous. Going and sitting with a family uh, where, you know, where there's been a death in the family, that's needed, but that's hard. Uh, you know, sitting in a, in a hospital when someone's having a major surgery and you're not sure whether or not they're going to make that, that's needed. But that's not glamorous, and that can be hard. Counseling a family, a couple where their marriage or their family's coming apart or there's been betrayal or something like that, y'all, that's not glamorous either. It's needed, but it's not glamorous. So don't get the idea that, you know, when you're involved in ministry, especially in full-time ministry, that it's always glamorous because it's not. Jesus asked James and John when they came to him, and I think their mother was involved, and they said, we've got just a small request. Can one sit on your right side and the other on your left in your kingdom? And the first thing he asked them was, are you able to drink the cup that I have to drink? Jesus knew he was headed for the cross. Now, feeding 5,000, that was kind of cool. You know, opening the eyes of a blind man, that's kind of cool too. Having your hands, your wrist, your feet nailed to a cross and a spear stuck in your side and enduring a Roman, Roman scourging, that's not glamorous at all. So Jesus was telling them that, you know, ministry, there's some difficult, tough aspects to it and things that a lot of people will run from. He was letting them know that ministry is not always glamorous. Going back to our text for just a minute, verse 11, Paul says, to this very hour we go hungry and thirsty, we're in rags, we're brutally treated, we're homeless, we work hard with our own hands, when we're cursed we bless, when we're persecuted we endure it, when we're slandered we answer kindly. Up to this moment we've become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. He was saying there are times where, you know, we'd like to give everybody a piece of our mind, but we know that's not the right thing to do, and we know also if we did that, that it would damage our ministry. So there were some people who were questioning Paul's authority, and he was kind of showing them, you know, they were saying, well, we can be apostles just like you guys can. And Paul was saying, you need to understand that, you know, uh, there's a lot more to this than, than what you're aware of, and that uh, a lot of what goes along with being an apostle, with being, in his case, being a leader of, of the church, uh, a lot of that, you know, you're probably not going to want any part of. So, just remember that tough times in ministry are unavoidable. Uh, ministry can be frustrating. Ministry is not always glamorous, but ministry is needed. And anyone who's a believer needs to be involved in ministry. Second thing I want to share with you this morning about these verses and tough times in ministry, and it's this. And, and I think this is really, really important. So, so be sure and pay close attention to this. And it's the fact that Love helps when you have to say hard things. We already said ministry is unavoidable. It is. And one of the things, are, hard times in ministry are unavoidable, and they are. One of the things that I would file under hard times in ministry would be when you have to confront somebody, maybe even a church, but especially when you've got to confront somebody individually, 
that is always tough and that is always difficult. And sometimes difficult things, hard things need to be said. And while that's true, it's important that people know that you love them. Because if they know that you love them, they're going to accept those hard things, those difficult things, a lot more, a lot better. They're going to accept it a lot better than if, you know, hey, he's just, you know, going off on me and he doesn't care anything about me. So love helps when you have to say hard things. I had a really good mentor. I, I normally don't mention names, but I'm going to mention names here. I had a really good mentor, a guy named Zane Clark. He was my pastor in uh, Texarkana at uh, Grace Temple Baptist Church. It's now Spring Lake Baptist. But he was my pastor when I surrendered to the ministry. And he was, uh, he was one of my mentors. And some of the best advice that I ever heard uh, was, was, the advi was this advice that he gave me. He said, Bob, he said, when you're, when you're a pastor, when you're involved in ministry, he said, be sure and love your people. He said, if you love your people, they'll listen to you. If you've got to preach a tough sermon, they'll hear it a lot better. If you've got to, you know, confront somebody. He said, always love your people. That makes all the difference in whether or not, you know, they'll listen to you and pay attention to you. And I've always been grateful that he told me that. And I've always been grateful that the Lord put that on his heart because I really believe that's true. Uh, that's true. Parents, make sure your kids know that, that you love them. Uh, that way, when you've got to do something that's tough, even though they may not like it, when they're alone, they're going to know that, hey, mom, hey, dad, I know they love me. Uh, if you have a Sunday school class uh, or you have some other ministry in the church, maybe you're a leader of the men or a leader of the women, it's so important that they know that you love them. Uh, even in baseball, growing up, I played a lot of baseball. And I had coaches that, uh, you know, most of my coaches cared about us, and so I was more willing to listen to them than another coach that I remember in particular that he was really good with teaching, but he just couldn't connect with the kids. And I didn't want to hear from him what I was willing to hear from other guys. So love helps when you have to say hard things. Look with me going in, down in verse 14. It says, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you. Now listen, he says, as my dear children, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. He says you have 10,000 guardians. In other words, you may have a lot of spiritual leaders, but Paul says you only got one spiritual father. He was the guy that started the church at Corinth. So nobody else would ever be able to take that special place that Paul had. And so he was just reminding them that I'm not saying these things because I don't love you. I'm saying these things because I do love you. Kind of like when, you know, I was growing up and my parents, when they'd have to give me a spanking, I'm doing this because I love you. And I'd think, man, you're about to love me to death. You know, I don't need to be loved that much. But they did discipline me because they loved me. And a spiritual leader, a pastor, a minister will say hard things, not because they don't love you, but because they do love you and they want to tell you the truth and they want you headed not in the wrong direction, but to repent and head in the right direction. I will say this, I think that's why a long-term pastorate is important. I've always believed that, you know, if you are just somewhere two or three, four years and then you're moving on, that you're just not as effective as if you're able to put down roots and, and you know, when the babies are born, you're there. When people are sick, you're there. When there's a death in the family, you're there. And this plays out over a number of years. And the pastor, the leader, becomes kind of like the old country doctor, the family doctor used to be, who would make house calls and who is just almost part of the family. I think God, that's the way God wants to see wants people to see spiritual leaders in the church that, you know, we're a church family, but it's almost like they're part of my family because I know that they love me. One more thing that's important, and it's the fact that a life of integrity is essential. If you've got to tell somebody tough, something tough, you better have, and you need to have a life that backs it up. That's why Paul says in verse 16, he says, therefore, he says, because I'm your father through the gospel. He says, therefore, I urge you to imitate me. 
That's a tough statement. He says, I want you to live the way I'm living. You can't make that statement if you don't have the life to back it up. Then he goes on, he says, For this reason I'm sending to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Now, that doesn't mean Paul was perfect. He wasn't. But it means that he did his dead level best to have a life that reflected what he taught the people, not only at the church at Corinth, but in all the churches that he was involved with and where he taught everywhere. So a life of integrity is so important. In fact, that's one of the reasons that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when it's given the qualifications for a pastor, uh, one of the first things that's mentioned, in fact, I think it's the very first thing, is that his life is to be blameless or above reproach. And that doesn't mean sinless. Uh, Paul wasn't sinless. The only person who's ever been sinless is Jesus. But it means that you're doing your best to live according to what God says in His Word, and that there's nothing major that just stands out as something that is an ongoing, unrepented of sin in your life. So, a life of integrity and making sure that your people love you when you have to say hard things. That's an important thing to remember when you're talking about tough times in ministry. Because one of the toughest things in ministry is to confront someone and say, this isn't, what you're doing isn't right, and you need to change that. And I think it's important to always be gentle when you do that, but don't apologize for what the Bible teaches and for what the Bible says. Last of all, uh, in these verses that we've just read, uh, tough times in ministry, the last thing that I want you to see is this. Meekness, and by meekness I mean humility. Meekness or humility is not weakness. Now, we're called upon to be servant leaders, and that means we're to be humble. Uh, any pastor, including myself, who the first thing you think about is that guy's cocky and that guy's arrogant. There's a problem there. So, you know, leaders, uh, men of God, people leading the church, uh, humility, meekness, very, very important. But then the church doesn't need to mistake in that for weakness because the Bible does not teach that meekness is weakness. In fact, in these final verses, Paul says, beginning in verse 18, some of you become arrogant as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. Now, you talk about calling somebody out, he says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? I've had, in my ministry, I've had to say some tough things. I'm not sure I've ever had to say it exactly like that. Paul says, you know, if I need to get the whip out, I can get the whip out. I, I prefer not to. But if I need to do that because some people are questioning my authority, his authority as an apostle, he says, I can do that because I think you're about to mistaken humility for weakness. And, you know, meekness, humility is not weakness. And I think with those words, Paul proves that. He says, you know, I, I want to be gentle, but if I need to be tough, he says, I can be tough. So just need to remember that. In fact, if you go to 2 Corinthians 2.1, he talks about, he says, I, I really don't want to come and have another painful visit. And so a lot of uh, theologians and uh, Bible commentary commentators believe that when he came after he wrote 1 Corinthians that he had to have a, quote, painful visit because some of these people insisted on, uh, you know, having their way and not doing what, what he had told them to do and even were qu continuing to question his authority. And so I think he probably did have to, you know, uh, to use his terms, you know, use the whip. So, just uh, to finish up, never mistaken humility for being weak. Jesus, the ultimate example of humility, he wasn't weak at all. He, uh, he never whimpered. He never cried out when he was on the cross. Uh, everything he said uh, while he was on the cross had a specific purpose. And uh, if anybody ever showed strength, it was the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. Moses, the Bible says, was, was the, at his time was the meekest man upon the face of the earth. But when he died, he was 
120 years old, and when he began to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, he was 80 years old. Man, you know, for most people at 80, they're thinking about retirement. He was just beginning a great ministry. So Moses, again, an individual, a leader who was, was humble, Jesus, a leader who was humble. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Why does that work that way? Why, why should meekness never be mistaken for weakness? And I'll tell you why. James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud or the arrogant. These people who were being arrogant at Corinth, God was resisting them. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So when we're humble, when we're meek, we get more of God's grace. And God is doing for you what you cannot do for yourself. So it's a matter of when Bobby or whoever's listening, when we humble ourselves, then God puts our strength over to the side and replaces our weakness with his strength. And so that's why meekness should never be mistaken for weakness. So just remember that what we've said about tough times in ministry. They're unavoidable. Okay, that's, that's a big part of, of doing ministry. They're unavoid, or unavoidable, so don't try to avoid them, but deal with them in a biblical way. One of the ways you deal with them biblically is by making sure that people know you love them because it'll go a lot better if they know that. And then finally, deal with them not with arrogance but with humility because when you're humble, that's when you're strong. I'm going to pray for you. I hope you've enjoyed this study tonight. Uh, may God bless you. Thanks again to John Bunyard for volunteering his time and making sure this can be posted on our uh, Facebook uh, tonight for, uh, so you can watch it uh, by way of, of live stream. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this study, and I pray that you will uh, help all of us, Lord, when we face those hard times in ministry to be like the Apostle Paul, to be like Jesus, to try not to, you know, not to put a lot of energy into avoiding them, but instead, Lord, put our energy into dealing with them from a biblical standpoint. Lord, help us to always love people. And Lord, help us not to be arrogant, but to be humble. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, and God bless you.